One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Hey Jeff, how's it going? Very good, Kevin. How are you today? Doing good, doing good. Just uh, jumping in here to catch up on some uh, on some painting. Sounds great. About eighty percent through the last uh, week's mini, I was catching up back on the Vampire Lord. I've got to go back into the glazes now. Okay, right on. So are you ready to paint the Dark Elf today? Yeah, you bet. I'm just trying to find uh, something that's similar to the um, Black Indigo, and I don't think I have anything that's kind of similar. I mean, I guess it's just basically like a black that's got a little bit of a purplish in it. Yeah. That that that's pretty much what it is. Like it's just, uh, or even just a little bit of dark blue would do the uh, would do the job. Um, okay. You know, I might have a black blue somewhere. Let me see. I don't know why the camera wasn't cooperating there, but now we're, now we're back to life. All right. So the, the general plan for this guy is we're going to basically do some traditional dark elf skin. We're going to give him a cool looking staff with like bones and stuff on it. We're really going to focus on that spider that he's got going on at the end of the staff. And uh, kind of see where we uh, see where we go from there. It's a nice looking mini. This particular mini has quite a few mold lines that are a bit of a challenge to deal with. Let's see if I've got a good sharp knife here. Nope. It's a particular mold lines that a lot of people have find a hard time with on this guy. focus working a bit better. And the focus. There we go. So yeah, there's a, there, there you can see there the mold line that I'm talking about. It goes over his shoulder, over his head, around the spider down his arm, right down the middle of that little scroll tube. It's a bit of a challenging one to get to, but it's worth taking the time to uh, get rid, rid of as much of that one as you can, just to make your, your final mini look a little bit better. Do that one in his shoulder. We want to get rid of that. Sorry, there we go. Doesn't look too great. The cleanup job I'm doing on is pretty basic too. We're not too worried about making this guy look perfect. But uh, just get the worst of that off there. And then I'm going to talk about one of my favorite subjects comes up all the time discussing these Reaper Bones minis, which is, well, I scraped some of the paint away getting rid of that mold line. Do I have to go and prime my mini again? And the, the secret is I never primed this mini in the first place. I just put on a first coat of paint. Put on a coat of black paint. It stuck to the mini just fine. And then I put on a coat of light gray paint and a little bit of white paint through the airbrush to pick out the details of what's called a Zenithal highlight. You can do it just as easily with a dry brush. It gives you a very similar result. 
but with the Bones Minis, you don't need to prime them, as in, you don't have to put a first coat of primer on them in terms of the primer which is designed to etch the surface and make it easier for the acrylic paint to stick. The acrylic paint sticks just fine without primer, but it's useful to put on a first coat of paint, of paint that's black so that any spot you miss ends up being black and looks like a shadow on your finished mini. There we go, it's just a tiny little bit of extra cleanup, nothing too serious. Always worth doing that. All right, so as for the plan, I'm gonna start with the skin tone. And the skin tone I'm gonna to use on this, I grabbed uh, Reek Burr's Dark Elf Skin, which is gonna be my starting skin tone. So I'm gonna build the palette by having that as my mid-tone. But it's quite a dark paint, so that's not gonna be my, um, really my mid-tone, it's more of the, sh of the shadow color. I'm going to go quite a bit lighter than this, and I'm going to use um, Reaper's Creamy Ivory to build up the skin tone, make the lighter areas. We'll use a bit of pure white at the end for the skin tone. Actually, I'm using Reaper's Solid White, but it has the same effect. I'm using Solid White on the hair as well, so I'm going to put a dab of that down there. Uh, to make the shadows in the skin, I think maybe I'll use this one. Let's try this. Just need a slightly darker color, right? So I'm going to use Reaper's old Dusky Shadow. But uh, Dusky Shadow, Burgundy Wine, any of those colors does basically the same job. And I'll throw some Burgundy Wine on there as well. Which is basically just allow you to make a shade with your skin tone that's not black. So it doesn't, like, the, the black paint tend to make things look a bit muddy and dirty, so that's not what we're doing. We're going to use a different paint to do that. Uh, what else should I throw on the palette right now? Snow Shadow is going to be the base color for my white hair. So I'll put a daub of Snow Shadow on there. And I think I said I was going to use Black Indigo for the hair as well, so let's find that Black Indigo paint. It's usually a hard one to find in the paint barrel here, because it's... It's a bit of a beat up looking container of paint. I'll use that as the darkest element of the hair. I'll probably use that for black lining things as well. And what else do we need? We need something for the cloak. So I think I was going to use burgundy wine and red was going to be my cloak color. So I'm going to put a big dab of burgundy wine on there. And the cloak was going to be red, so I'll just use fire red. Getting a red cloak. Ooh, that's a gungy looking paint. Let's get rid of that blob. That's not going to do the job. Get my handy pin here. Pop out the neck of that bottle. Just about out of fire red. I might have to go get a new one off the shelf. Had to do that last week with the blood red. But uh, there we go. A good start to the day. Covered in paint already. That's exactly what we want. So that's our cloak. And I think what else was I planning for today? Let's double check. A uh, bit of stone gray for the base. Don't need that right now, though. Uh, some dragon black. We'll get that later. Black indigo, stone gray. Polished bone. Bone is what I was missing. There we go. Bone for the staff and a bunch of his little details. There we go. Bone color. And we'll use a bunch of the other colors to make that look right okay back on track let's get all rid of all these open windows I don't need anymore and uh, focus is working reasonably well people seem to be able to see me if you have questions don't hesitate to ask um, if you're following us on twitch and you want the link sent again just go ahead and let me know and I'll pop the link in the chat again and uh, yeah, away we go. 
So I'm going to start use a slightly larger brush today. I'm going to use a size 2. I think previously I've been using a size 1, but I'm trying to break in a new brush. So I'm using a size 2. Size 2 Windsor & Newton today. But slowly breaking this brush in. And so uh, the first thing I want to do, knowing that I'm going to be uh, doing the flesh tone, my shadow color is going to be the burgundy wine. I'm going to be using the burgundy wine as the color underneath the cloak as well. Um, I think the armor we're going to do kind of a gray black color. That might be what I wanted the stone gray and the black for. Yep, let's get the stone, let's get the black out there. There's some black. And stone gray for the armor. That's what we need. He's just wolf gray instead, doesn't matter. Wolf gray. Wolf gray, stone gray, it's all the same. Okay. So I'm going to start by putting um, a coat on the bone so I can play with that while other, th while other things are drying. Just line that up a little bit better. There we go. So for the bone on the staff, I'm going to think I'm going to add a little bit of. Uh, that black I just put out there, add some black to it, make it a bit of a darker gray. I'm going to use that as the first coat on the bone on the staff. So my plan is to put kind of a base coat on most things. And while it's drying, we'll work on another area so that we don't end up um, damaging the paint as we go by repainting over paint that is still wet. So I'm going to put this color over all of the staff, eye sockets on the skull. It's got a very cool spider clinging to the back of the, uh, the bones on the staff. We're we'll painting the whole staff this gray color, which is basically just a little bit of that polished bone color mixed with a little bit of black just to darken it just a touch. I'm not thinning these paints with water as I go. I'm just doing a kind of a fairly thick first coat, but I'm making sure that I maneuver the paint with the brush so that I don't end up with a thick layer that's going to take a long time to dry. Just a relatively thin layer of paint. Get that staff basically covered. Including on the back, which is a little bit difficult to see. Looking at the back of that staff as well. All right, there we go. We got the staff painted its first coat of paint. And then for the cloak, I'm going to paint the cloak um, 50% burgundy wine and 50% fire red. It's going to give me this really kind of interesting uh, red violet color. So half burgundy wine, half fire red. And what that's going to do for me is when I go to put my shadows on with the burgundy wine and put some highlights on with the red, that color is already there as the base color on the cloak. And it Gonna, the two are going to work together a little bit better as a result. Okay. I probably should have washed this mini again. This mini's been sitting on the shelf for quite a while. And it probably should have given it a quick wash before I started today. What can happen is, you know, people handle the minis, people look at them and ask questions about them, and uh, a little bit of skin oil on them and the paint doesn't stick that well as a result. It's one of the reasons you'd always wash your mini before you start. So I made a mistake there. I should have given it a good rinse before sitting down today. So probably most of the paint's not going to stick during the day. But you can learn from my mistake, I guess. So we'll do the inside edge on both the left and right of the cloak. 
inside under. Hey, Jeff. Yep. Hello. Hey. Uh, sorry, I was a little late. I had a trouble, a trouble Not connecting there. Um, uh, are, are we just doing some under under coating right it's now? Just, it's, 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 it's like uh, a, a, we're doing a sort of a base coat on most areas of the of the mini, and uh, what we've done okay. already is we put a, a first coat of uh, like a light gray color on the staff, mm -hmm. and now we're taking uh, burgundy wine. And mixing it 50-50 okay. with our fire red. And that's going to be the first coat of paint we put on uh, the entirety of the cloak. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll catch up. Right on. I'm going to put that on the armor plate on the shoulder of the cloak as well. And work my way all the way around the mini. And I'm not thinning the water, or thinning the paint with water. I'm just uh, being careful not to overload the brush and just work the edge of the wet paint to get the layer nice and smooth. And it's a thin layer of paint rather than a paint layer that's been thinned before it was applied. As Aaron Lovejoy likes to say, it's. Uh, We're painting thinly versus thinning paint. I think I might be misquoting him on that, but that's the general idea. Get right up over both shoulders. Yeah, I really should have washed this mini before I started. <laughs> it's not looking too good. It's not that it's not looking good, it's just that the paint's not sticking very well because I, uh, like I said, the mini's been handled quite a bit. All the minis for these classes are sitting on the desk here at the studio. And so when people are uh, coming in and asking questions and what mini are you going to paint next week, I show them the mini, they take a look at it, decide if they're going to buy one or not, and order one from Reaper or whatever they want to do. And uh, yeah, I definitely should have taken that into consideration when I started. It's going on all right, though might have to redo a few little spots. I don't know if you can see that on the camera, but like right there, the slight oiliness has made the paint separate a little bit. A little bit of a gap opened up. And that probably means that once the miniature is painted, the paint might rub off a little bit more easily. But I'm not too worried about that. If this mini ends up on the gaming table somewhere, somebody will be eating Doritos or something. Get grease all over it anyway. There's not much that's going to survive that process. Just going around that cloak again, making sure I didn't miss anything. Get rid of those chips of paint that I, or chips of uh, the old mold line that I trimmed off that I should have cleaned off earlier. Get rid of those. Okay, I'm pretty happy with that. Now I did make a mess and I hit the back of that staff with a big blob of purple paint. I'm going to clean that off now. Or paint over it to get rid of it. You can see that right in there. I made a big mess. Yeah, the same mistake. It's kind of hard not to. Yeah, it's a hard spot to reach into, isn't it? Yeah, same here. Yep, and that's the way it goes. So that's where uh, a little bit of planning will help in the sense that uh, you paint things from the inside out, like the more difficult to reach things first and then the things that are easier to reach afterwards. But... Uh, I want to have this staff painted and dry so that we can paint that cool spider on the back of it later. And uh, I just want the staff to be dry as early as possible in the process. But probably, if I, was, like, if I wasn't trying to paint a bit against time on camera, I'd have left that staff, the staff pretty much to the end. And of course, in the process of painting the staff, I'm going to make a mistake and paint it on the cloak. That's normal. You just let it dry and correct the mistake later. You said that was just a light gray that you did on the staff? Yeah, so I have on the palette, I have polished bone and okay. a, a black color. And I just mix them 50 50 to make myself a lighter gray or a like slightly darker gray. And eventually the whole staff, except for the metal bit there, is going to look like it's painted bone color. So this is just to give the bone color something to stick to. 
doesn't right really, on. doesn't really matter exactly what color it is. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put a first coat of paint on the hair. Now, as I said, the hair is it's going to be traditional dark elf skin color, so the hair is going to be steely white. So I, the black I'm using for the hair is uh, Reaper's Black Indigo. And black indigo is a bit of a transparent paint. So for this first coat, I'm going to get a bit of a dollop of this black indigo, and I'm going to add some snow shadow into it, which is going to give me this purpley looking gray. It's quite a dark gray. And that's what I'm going to paint as the first coat on the hair. Then I have the black indigo to use if I need to make something darker. And I'll also work my way up using the snow shadow later to create highlights on the hair. So this color is going to go over all of the hair, underneath the bangs. Or I guess they're not bangs, but under the hair on the front of his face. I'm also going to put a line of this um, eventually as his uh, eyebrows. I'll, I'll do that later on after I get the skin tone done. So just a first coat of paint over the hair. Would I be all right using that nightshade purple on that? Yeah, definitely, definitely. And use it exactly the same way. Put some uh, snow shadow into it. Even though the the night shadow, or sorry, the nightshade, uh, is a very opaque color, put a little bit of the snow shadow in it so that if you need to add a shadow to it, you've got somewhere to go. Okay. Just lighten it up a little. Just bit. lighten it up a little bit. Yeah. Right now. Actually, the uh, nightshade purple will look quite good against the background of that uh, burgundy and red cloak that we're doing. Yeah, it's already kind of coming out a bit, the, the purple and the, and the nightshade, I mean. Yep. Right on. Yeah, I love that triad. It's just... Uh, I, I always tell people that there's every paint line has a few certain colors that are really, really useful and really nice. And that whole royal purples triad is... Uh, so royal purples or imperial purples, whichever it is. The it's amethyst purple, imperial purple, and nightshade purple. It's a great triad. I use the nightshade purple as a black all the time. All right, that looks good enough for me. All the hair painted that color, and let's do our first coat on the skin tone. So the areas that are going to get skin tone are going to be his hands and his face and his ears. That's really the only part of him that's uh, that's visible. There's something a bit strange going on in the center of his armor here. It does look a bit like he's holding his guts in like he got stabbed or something, but uh, I think we'll just treat that shape as like it's some sort of ornate shape in the leather of his armor. I'm going to guess that where he's a wizard it's not going to be metallic armor. It's more stylized. I can see some stitches down here. So we're going to treat that like it's a bit of a hard cloth or soft leather sort of armor. So, for the skin, uh, I'm going to start with actually I'm going to start with dark elf skin, which is my mid tone. So I'm going to put that first coat of paint I'm going to put on there is going to be dark elf skin, just straight, no shadow, no highlight color, whatever, just a straight dark elf skin. And I'll probably have to put a couple of layers of this on to get a good first coat and then we're going to use uh, well you can use whatever color you want but I'm going to be adding burgundy wine in to make a shadow as well as using the dusky skin shadow but it doesn't have to be that color you can pretty much use any sort of purpley gray Would I be all right mixing maybe like some snow shadow and amethyst purple? Would that be so. The close? snow shadow is already darker than amethyst purple. Okay. Um, so if you have imperial purple, 
the imperial e... purple with a bit of yeah. uh I should give it a little bit of white and a little bit of black just to make it into a gray. That'd be a good color to start right. with. Cool. This is just to make the, the skin tone a bit dusky looking. Uh, the main skin color is actually could probably end up being that creamy ivory color that's also on the palette. Darker skin is one of those funny skins that depending on, you know, whether you're following the canon for a particular edition of D&D &D or... Um, you know, that skin could be like gloss night black, or it could be light purple, or it could be light blue. If you're playing a game like Warhammer or one of those, the Dark Elf skins are not dark color. They're just Dark Elf means that they're not particularly friendly. But they still have like an elf, a, a, like a classic, very light colored elf skin tone. But uh, for our game... Hey Jeff, here, like in the... Uh... A dark elf skin. There's like a triad with the yep. the shadow and the highlight. Yep, um, I'm just curious because uh, a lot of times I don't people don't see them using that as the shadow though. Uh, no. I mean, I I like it for other things. I use it on like light blues and stuff all the time. It's uh, it's a nice color, but uh, I the way I paint these days, I tend to make my own highlight and shadow colors, and uh, you know, there's there's nothing wrong with that triad. I, it's really a matter of choice as to which one you want to use. I just wonder if it wasn't enough contrast with the uh, no, shadow between. No, not at all. Like when, when, particularly when you do like elfin skin tones, um, you don't necessarily need the contrast to be harsh. Um, so if you want the skin tone to have smooth shadows and highlights, the more steps between colors you have, uh, generally speaking, the smoother it's going to look. So. Um, if I started with like nightshade purple and worked my way all the way up to a pure white, I'm going to want to have 10, 12, 15 steps of color to do that. And that, that's going to give me a smooth transition between those colors. If, uh, if you start with a triad, right, like the, the dark elf highlight is not that much lighter than the dark elf skin. There's the two side by side, right? There, there's not a huge amount of difference between those two. Um, I might not even have a half step between those, but certainly between the Dark Elf Highlight and the Pure White, there might be three, four, five more steps. And between the Dark Elf Skin and the Dark Elf Shadow, three more steps down to, the, say, the Nightshade Purple. So it's just it's a question of choice as to how many steps you want to have um, and whether you want to use the, the, the triad as three of the steps in the middle. Does that Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. Yep. If it doesn't, please call me on it, and I'll try again. <laughs> no, no, absolutely makes sense. Thank you. With a time change, it's been a bit... Uh, I, I was up pretty early today, and I just played a five-hour game of Warhammer, Age of Sigmar, that I lost. So my mind might... My brain might be a little numb. Some of what I say might not make the best sense, so... All right, I've been studying yeah. all day, so I'm uh, I'm in the same boat. There and you I've go. got two young kids who are trying to adjust to the time change, too, so... I hear Here you. we are. I hear it. Yeah, my wife sent me a meme saying, uh, please remember to roll your clocks back to darkness and despair. Oh, yeah, I saw that one coming around. I kind of like the, ch the change because it means that when I get up in the morning, it's not dark right now. and the uh, It'll be dark by the time I go home from here, but uh, I'm more of a morning person, so I like it when there's light in the morning. I kind of yeah, like same. the time change. But, uh, I, liked, I liked it before I had kids. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the kids don't adjust to it very quickly. Oh, All sure. Right. So my uh, my first coat of paint with, on the cloak, which was the mix of burgundy wine and the red, uh, is, is kind of splotchy. So I'm going to reapply that layer of paint. If yours looks good, like when I say splotchy, I mean that the, the paint is actually pulled apart and I can see the the uh, that gray undercoat uh, through the holes. So I'm going to reapply that where the paint got really splotchy. If yours is good, you don't need to reapply this coat. It's totally matter of choice but the reason I'm redoing it is because there's bare uh, that, that first gray coat of paint is showing through and normally that wouldn't bother me which is like the this uh, layer wasn't very opaque and I could see a little bit of the gray like showing through streaky brush strokes but the paint is actually separated like it was beating up in your car window and uh, 
there's gaps, physical gaps in the paint, making little divots. So I'm filling those in. There we go. That's a little better. And that's another reason why you should wash your miniature before you start to paint. Okay. There we go. That's looking better. That's starting to dry pretty quick. So for the uh, the armor on there, as I'm looking at it now, I'm seeing these various armor plates. And I think what I want to do is this color that we're going to paint his cloak. I want something similar on this skirt that he's got going around underneath so that armor plates will show up a little bit better. So I think I'm going to paint that area underneath just straight burgundy wine. So it'll have a bit of the same color to it, but it's going to be much darker than his cloak. His cloak's going to be lighter than this kind of skirt underneath. So I'm going to paint that first layer of skirt straight burgundy wine. And this is going to take two layers again as well, I think, because the because of my dirty mini. And even though we've just started right. painting, I am not starting all over again at this stage. It's just, I'm going to fight it all the way through. So if somebody only tunes into this video for 20 seconds, they're going to learn to wash their mini before they start painting. I'm going to be like a broken record the whole way through. Sorry, you were saying... So you, 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 I was just, you want that underskirt to be uh, darker than the cloak? Yeah, it's going to be darker okay. than the cloak. Cool. But with these, uh, with these paint longs, one of the reasons I don't say you need exactly these paints well in advance is because the technique that I'm trying to use here does not require you to have the same paint. Um, it's useful to have the same idea about how to highlight and how to shade, but it doesn't have to be the exact same paint. So I don't want people to buy like the same 10, the same 10 paints that I'm using just to try to match it because it, it really is not, not required. All right. So for the armor, we're going to do that armor, that gray color. So I'm going to take the black. I think I used solid black. I'm going to put some of that wolf gray in there. It's going to be quite a bit darker than what we did on the staff. There we go. That's what I want. And that is going to be the base color for the armor plates, not including that one armor plate up on his shoulder. So everything in the background, but not the armor plate on his shoulder. Is getting this really dark gray color. Now, as we progress, I'm going to start. I'm going to make it look a bit more leathery by kind of stippling the paint a bit. So that's my plan for the armor: is to make it look like battered leather by stippling on the highlights with this powdery gray. I do believe he's got some kind of like a, I don't know, maybe it's a ring for chaining captives to or something on his belt. Dark Elf Wizard with a spider on his staff. I don't think he's a very friendly guy. Certainly not in the traditional first edition D&D sense. He wouldn't be a very friendly guy. I usually have Spotify running all the time while I'm painting, but uh, since this is going out on Twitch as well as on Discord and it's going to end up on YouTube, got to have the gotta keep the music you're, out of it. You're stuck with us for a soundtrack. Stuck with you guys for a soundtrack, Sorry. which is which is all good. I I don't mind that as long as uh, <laughs> the soundtrack doesn't become snoring. Then that's a bit of a a downer for me, but uh, singing in my case, you don't want that. <laughs> I hear you, Kevin. I'm pretty bad too. So, without saying what I was doing and without really thinking about it, I decided to make this little bit of the staff dark gray as well for no other reason than I wasn't thinking about it while I was painting. I hadn't intended to do that really, but it's done now. I'll live with it. Finish painting the red of the leather the rest of the leather armor this gray apparently i'm going to paint 
most of that necromancer staff this gray by mistake. Yeah, I'm like, okay, I got, I'm starting to get a better sense of what he's going to look like now. Last time I painted I love, this mini... I love that moment in the process. I, yeah, exactly. Up until now, I now I've been confused about what I'm going to do. But uh, the, the last time I painted this guy, I gave him a pumpkin, a Halloween pumpkin tartan. And uh, it's been hard to break that vision. <laughs> so <laughs> now I'm starting to see him more as a dark, gloomy wizard with battered armor and robes. I have a feeling that he's been pushed around quite a bit by the priestesses of Lolth and all those fun folks in his hometown. So he's going to be looking pretty beat up and he's going to have a pretty bitter expression on his face. So that's my plan now for this guy. He's going to be looking bitter, beat up, and if we have time I'll do something fancy on the back of his cloak to give him one point of pride. But other than that, that's the this is the agenda for today. All right. This poor Windsor Newton brush I'm using is really not breaking in very well. It's uh, kind of all over the place, no matter what I do with it. So, do you have many uh, brushes at, at the shop? I didn't look last time I was in. Um, I, I'm kind of getting low. I've got about half a dozen Windsor and Newtons left, and a couple of Rosemary and Co., but not many more than that. I'm due for a, for an upgrade here. These ones are getting pretty rough. It's an unfortunate thing. How do you say that your brushes typically last on the good, you know, nice sable hair? Like, um, as far as you know, they're taking care of them and, and doing all that. How, how long they last? I know eventually they kind of do still give up the ghost. See, I, I find that they go through phases. Sometimes they're, uh, sometimes they die really quick, and then I just use them for general work. Uh, by really quick, I mean you know six weeks. Um, but then I just use them for general work, and they and they suddenly get better again, and I go back to using them for detail. Uh, sometimes you just have to wait till a bristle breaks out and the brush forms a bit better. Um, and sometimes, like I f find like. Sort of like this particular Windsor Newton. I don't know if you can see that, but it's got a, a little bit of a split in it. Mm, yes. I'm trying to work that out of it. Um, I mean, I've been cleaning it every day and doing all the usual stuff to it to see if it'll eventually work its way out. But so this, in my opinion, like a brush like that, sometimes may never be really a good brush for detail. And that's what you want the sables for is the fine point to control your detail for the most part. Um, whereas these two, or these, uh, Da Vinci's, right? Da Vinci Maestro Series 11. I bought these in August 2021, and I've been using them almost every day, and they're doing just fine. And some, some days they don't work as well, other days they're just like suddenly the point comes back and they're brilliant. This Rosemary & Co., um, I've had it for a couple of years. So what's this? this is a Series 33. Had it for a couple of years. I was mostly just using it for lines, and it was great for more than a year. Uh, but now I've been doing a lot of detail with it, and it's starting to lose its tip. So the only answer I can give you on that one, Kevin, is sometimes they last a really, really long time, and sometimes they're never good in the first place. Like there's another Windsor Newton Series 7, size 1, and uh, I'm undecided as to whether this one is good or garbage. It's just... Funny thing. Do you use uh, conditioners? Ones are Newton. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I oh, do. Sorry, I, was, I, yeah. I use conditioner on them. I clean them at the end of every session, put the conditioner on them. But that uh, doesn't necessarily save them. And it doesn't necessarily kind of help them break in properly. So mm. if they get really crusty, I use uh, Windsor Newton, that harsher brush cleaner, or I'll use the Avalon 502 magic potion but uh, I don't do that I don't find a need to do that very often might be once every couple of months that I put a brush in that but I use the conditioner at the end of every session and that really makes a difference um, yeah 
any did that did, was there another question there kevin no that was it thank you i i, I liked your point about that sometimes there never are because that the first time i ordered a sable hair i ordered a windsor newton and it arrived and it never quite had a point that was right like from the yeah. beginning and it never did and yeah. And then I've gotten several other sable hairs that are just wonderful, including Windsor Newton. So yeah. I was like, all right. The only, the <laughs> Sometimes only, they're not so good. The only brush I've ever had, the only brush type I've ever had that was good every single time at the start. Uh, there's two of them. One was the Raphael 8402. And the other one was the Raphael 8400. Um, 8404s are normally really good. They're not always really good, but they're normally really good. But the 8402, which is the cream colored one, this is the one with that cream color on the on the handle, not the not the orange. Those uh, I've never had a miss on one of those, which is a good thing because they cost like 20 bucks more than the other ones. I think yeah, that, that sure. size two these days is going for about 50 bucks Canadian, and I've never had a miss on one of them. But the the 8404 sometimes are just I don't know, not as nice or don't last as long. Unfortunately, there's well, no I hope vendors have answer. a bunch of them at the LVO. Yeah. There's a good chance you'll be able to pick them up there. Uh, lost track of what I'm doing. Okay, red cloak. I'm going to do a layer of the fire red now on the cloak. And this is, I'm just kind of mixing this into the edge of the previous layer of red that I had, or mix it with burgundy wine. So it's not going to be straight fire red, but it's mostly fire red. And I put a layer of this anywhere that uh, the light's going to hit. And I, again, I forgot to tell you at the start which way my light is. And in my mind, the, in my mind, the light is coming from like over his right shoulder. So kind of front, right. So we're going to like half of this skull, a bit of the spider, this side of his staff, his, the right side of his face. His right arm and then down on that side. That's that's the light direction that I'm that I'm aiming for. So let's skip painting. Get that red on there. Gonna try to get this. Sorry, did you say you darkened it down? Your your fire red, you darkened that down a little bit? Yeah, I'd say it's like eighty percent fire red and just a touch of the burgundy wine in there. Really not very much. Okay. So this is like the highlight underneath his arm. Mm. Where not much light is going to hit at all. That'll be my start point. And wipe that stuff off with my finger with the mess I made. Do a little bit of it out here on this part of the cloak. There we go. That's enough to make it visible. And I'm going to work my way clockwise around the mini. So looking at the top right shoulder, well, top left shoulder for him, right from our perspective. And my brush strokes are going to be pulling towards the light direction there. I'm going to do the same color on his little scarf that he's got on there. And the brush strokes in this case are still pulling from right to left as much as I can. If not, I'll just do a little bit the other direction, but... Generally speaking, my brush strokes are going to be towards the light source on this guy. Same on this piece of his arm on his shoulder, same deal, start down at that little point, and then pull the brush strokes upwards towards the top of the shoulder. And you do a little bit of that down here in the edge of the cloak, not too much, just a little bit of a highlight. I want that mostly to be that first shadow color. Now I'm going to work on the back of him. So now our light source is up here. So the brush strokes go towards that direction. I'm going to start on this plate on his shoulder and pull upwards towards the previous highlight and kind of meet the two in the middle. So right along this line, okay, this is where the colors are going to be brightest facing towards the light source, right along here. Put a mark on the bottom actually where. So I've already got an arrow there. I'll turn it a little bit so it all lines up. That arrow is the direction of my light source. Okay. This bit on his shoulder, same deal. Brush strokes pulling upwards towards the top of the shoulder. 
Now normally the way I would paint this is I would hold my brush like this, orient the miniature, and then pull the brush strokes towards me. Okay, so I'm always pulling the brush strokes towards the light and I reorient the mini to make it work. However, if I keep doing that as I do this class or this paint along, the mini is going to be off screen most of the time. So I'm just going to try to keep the mini basically in one place and I will be reorienting the brush a little bit. But the general idea you want to stick in your mind is orient the mini to the brush rather than orienting the brush to the mini. And that way you'll be able to have better control over your brush strokes. There we go. Look at that. So now I'm looking for the raised areas where the light's going to catch more easily. I'm going to leave that low zone uh, as a shadow. I'm just going to paint the, the kind of the more raised up areas this red color. And I'm going to work my way all the way around the model doing the same thing. In this zone in here, most of that's going to be in shadow. So I'm just going to do a brush stroke pulling out from that shadow area. There's a few little tears in the cloak down there. Make sure I catch the edge of those with this color. But generally speaking, the brush strokes are working their way up towards the top. Okay, so I'm going to skip like three quarter of a centimeter of zone in here. That's going to stay shadow. And I'm going to catch the top of this piece over here. And now with the light coming from that direction, most of this side's going to be in shadow. So I'm really just focusing on the side of this roll of cloth facing towards the light. Okay, you need to work me around. You can see from the, the light direction, the light's not going to really hit the back of them there. And there might be a little bit of a bounce light come up from the ground, but not much. So I'm going to put a little bit of this highlight on the top of this largest fold, but not too much, just a bit. And probably this is going to get darkened down again when we go and do like a, we're going to do a bit of a blending glaze on this cloak at the end. And most of that is going to disappear when that happens. gives you a sense of what I'm hitting with the red and what I'm not. So as I'm doing that, I'm realizing that I've made these highlights back here a little bit more saturated with the red. And the first one that I did didn't get very much red on it at all. So I'm going to redo that first one right now, just to kind of bring it up to where I've made the other ones. And it's going to get much brighter later on. I'm going to be redoing the red on that a few more times. But I think I want to at least to start at the same level as the ones next to it. Make it a bit easier to keep the emphasis uh, towards the light. All right. So we've managed to come all the way around. I think just a bit of this red on the top of that shoulder will be enough. On top of that little leather plate. And where these, where the light would kind of come through under his arm, it would catch the top of these little tears in his cloak. I'm going to put a little bit more red around those little holes. That's probably enough. Okay, so we'll let that dry now. When I come back to that area, I'm going to put a, sh a deeper shadow in on uh, the shadow side. I'm going to darken the lower areas on the shadow side. All right, so let's go back to doing skin tone for a little while. So that was my starting... Oh, my camera seems to have shifted just a touch. Maybe I'll move this instead. There we go. Okay, so what I've got there is burgundy wine, uh, dusky shadow, dark elf skin, creamy ivory, and pure white. So I'm going to go down and do shadows first. So I'm just going to go down from the skin tone to this first darker color. And you can make this 
this could be dumb. If you added nightshade purple, this would do, like, I made a 50-50 mix, this would work. Um, it just needs to be a little bit darker than the, the skin tone that we started with. And this is going to go in all the shadow areas on the skin. So it's going to go in the eye sockets, uh, around the nose. I'm going to paint a little bit of a crease on his temple where the skin touches up against the side of the uh, the hair. I'm going to put this color in. With the light coming from that side, we know that this whole side of his face is going to be quite dark. So I'm going to paint quite a lot of shadow in there. And make sure I get that ear on the shadow side as well. Both eye sockets and again, in where the hair comes in close to his face. I'm going to put a line of this color around his face. So this face is going to look really rough at the early stages. So don't don't worry about that too much. It is going to look rough. I'm going to put a line of this color under his chin. And I'm also going to darken his lips to this color. Okay, now we'll do the same thing on his hands with this color while we're working with it. So I'll start with his left hand. No, I'll start with his right hand. Just kind of stick with the plan of going clockwise. So I'm going to put a line of this where that cuff meets his hand. I'm going to outline his hand where it's touching the armor with this color. So all the way around the hand. I'm going to put this in between the fingers. whole bottom part of the hand. Now the back of his hand has a little bit of carved detail, or sculpted detail. Can you just kind of make it out there on the camera? It's a bit like, like these shapes on the back of my hand. See how the veins are really prominent? So basically I want to put like a shadow between each knuckle and then extend it down along the back of the hand, which will give us a bit of an illusion of the sense of that kind of shape on the back of your hand. So there's my knuckles. Put the brush in between the knuckle and then pull it back along the hand. And we're going to do the reverse when we start doing the highlight colors. We'll start building up like the height of those knuckles and things like that again to bring the shape back. Same thing on the other hand. We're going to outline the hand everywhere it touches the staff and where it touches the armor. It gets a dark line around it. around. Sorry, drifted. Where the armor plate meets the back of his hand, we put a line. The bottom of the hand. And where this is on the shadow side, I'm basically going to paint most of this hand this color. But for sure, I want to make sure I get it nice and dark in between his fingers and underneath his hand. All right, there we go. That's our first layer of shadow color, and we're going to make sure we get this on his ear on the light side, which is up at the top. I'll get that on his ear as well. All right, there we go. Now, that's mo mostly dry on my guy. I hope yours is drying as well. And now I'm gonna take burgundy wine and I'm gonna mix it with that shadow color and make an even darker color. I'm going to redo what we just did with this color. I'm trying to make it a little bit smaller, kind of confine it to within the center of those shadows. So I don't want the brush overloaded. If you've got a fine detail brush, now is the time to use it because we're painting the face. And the same spaces again. So, eye sockets. Both sides. Side of the nose on both sides of the face. Got a little bit of a grim expression, so we're going to hit that little bit of a knot in his forehead. 
A little bit of a bump on his nose too. I'm gonna put that shadow to make it look like a little bit of a broken nose. I'm gonna paint this all around the hairline where the hairline meets the skin of his face. Line under his chin again. Darken his lips with this color as well. All the way around. Okay, that's enough on the face. The ear on the shadow side is going to get this color inside it. I'm going to make a line around the ear where it touches the hair with this color. Don't worry about it if you get a bit of this on the hair. We're going to go back over that again later. Same thing on the hair or the ear on the light side. I'm going to put around a shadow around the back of it. But the ear itself is going to be a much lighter color because it's on the light side. All right. And this color is now going to go on his hand. So we're going to define his thumb again. Line all the way around the hand. Line where the cuff of his armor meets the hand. Underneath the hand. All line all the way around where the fingers touch the front of his armor. And then a nice fine line in between all the fingers. And a touch of this between each of the knuckles. Kind of keep the shape of his hand coming along. Same thing on the other hand. Line in between the fingers. Outline the hand against the staff. Basically drawing a line with this purple color all the way around his hand where it touches any arm or any cloth or the staff and then again this dark color in between the knuckles I think we've got a nice shadow on the go now that's gonna be good enough for that and at this stage it's looking pretty dry let's give it another minute just to be sure so while we're waiting for that to dry this bit of skirting at the front this bit of skirting at the front, I'm going to make a mix of burgundy wine and uh, it doesn't matter, grab your black or your purple or whatever, I'm going to use some of this indigo black, I'm going to mix that in with the burgundy wine to make a shadow color, and this is going to be the shadow color on that cloak, not the cloak, the little skirt that's visible under the armor, so this, this thing under here. So I'm going to start on the side by the staff, I'm going to put it in the shadow there. Then kind of come around the front. There's like some little cuts in the little skirt. I'm gonna paint this in there. I'm gonna paint it on the bottom of the skirt, like underneath. And then on the front here, we've got that little spot where the armor touches it. I'm gonna put a line of this along there. There's a little rent or cut in it. I'm gonna fill the hole with this color. Same thing along the bottom edge of the hem of this skirt. There's like all these cuts in it. We're putting this dark color in there. And then this armor plate, where it touches that cloth, we want to put a nice big shadow along that. Like a line of this dark color where it's casting the shadow. The light's coming down, hitting this armor plate and casting a shadow on that skirt. We're going to make a nice dark shadow. Same thing on this plate. We'll do the same thing along the side of it. And paint there in all those little damaged holes underneath all the way around now there's my light arrow so these areas are going to be quite a bit lighter they don't have to be this full dark color I'm going to put a little bit of it right in that low spot right there a little touch of it right there but that's going to go away a bit when I do the highlighting later and put some right back in there at that low spot. I think that's probably enough with this color. All right. Give that a moment to dry as well. Starting to come along. So we're back to skin tone. And now we're going to start going up with our skin tone. So I'm going to grab the dark elf skin, put a little daub of it off to the side. And I'm going to start mixing in the creamy ivory just a tiny bit at a time 
to make like little steps of lighter color. So just a tiny daub of the creamy ivory and mix it in with this. Oh, this is going to be a color similar to the dark elf skin highlight in that tribe, but we're just going to keep going lighter with every step. So with this color, I'm going to go and hit all the highlights on the face and the hands. So I'm going to start, and on the ears. So I'm going to start on his forehead. He's got that little kind of a knot shape going on. So I'm basically like to make a V-shaped dot of this right in the middle of his forehead, more towards the light side than the dark side. Put a little bit of this on the, his brow above each eye. But I really don't want this to go into the shadow under his, like under his brow. I'm going to put a little bit of this on the bridge of his nose. I'm going to paint the whole side of his nose this color, but not all the way down to the shadow. Next time I'll just paint the nostril to bring the nose shape out. I'm going to hit the raised part of his cheek, but you want to be careful here not to get this into the eye socket. We want to keep the eye socket as dark as possible. And then the area above his mouth, we've got the little Cupid's bow there, we'll paint it this color his chin, but don't paint his lips. We'll leave those the color we just painted. And then the cheek side, you, which is, sorry, go ahead, Kevin. Oh, uh, it's me. Uh, are we going kind of along the jawline as well, or? Uh, so I'm, I'm going to paint his chin on the, the light side, but I'm not going to bring out his jawline. Okay, because okay. he's a dark elf with a very skinny face. I don't really want to emphasize a jawline too much, because then it'll start to look fatter, a bit more human, right? So on the shadow side, I'm going to paint just the nostril, the outside of the nostril, bring that shape back. And on the cheek, just the highest part of the round shape of the cheek, the little bit of a highlight. But again, I don't want to get this in the eye socket. And because of our strong uh, lighting direction, we don't really want to go any lighter than that. We want to keep it... Um, on the shadow side of the face, we don't want to go too much lighter. I want to stay in the dark shadow. I'm going to do this color on the tip of his left ear. Okay, and I'm going to do that on the top of his right ear as well. Now this Windsor Newton brush is fighting me the whole way. I might have to switch back to my Da Vinci to be successful today. So just highlighting the front of the ear with this color. And now I'm down to working on the knuckles. And let's just spot on his mouth. There we go. So the top of his thumb. Now this, this color is not the shadow color. So we're, keep, we're keeping this in the center of the shapes. So the center of his thumb and then on the back of his hand, line up the brush to the knuckle, okay, and then draw a line along the back of the hand to the knuckle. And when you get to the knuckle, put like a double dot of this color to kind of brighten it up a bit. And we do that for each of those four lines on the back of his hand and each of those four knuckles. And that's going to bring back the shape of our hand quite a bit. Change that angle a bit, and I do this on his fingers as well. On the brush stroke, on the fingers, he's going to start down towards the shadow side and pull up towards the knuckle. So, but and I'll do each one of these a couple of times. So, by the time I'm done, I'll have this color repeated like four or five times on the top of each knuckle. It's really going to bring those shapes out of the shadow. And now we do the other hand. Now the light side is the side with his thumb on it, so I'm going to paint quite a large light colored highlight with this on his thumb. And when I get to where the thumb goes around the side, I'm just going to put a little tiny bit of this. And same thing on those knuckles of his left hand, the ones that are closest to the, to the front. Just going to put a little bit of that on those, on the side facing the light, but not on the back not on the back side. 
If I go around to the back side, I'm just going to put a little tiny dab of this on each of the knuckles. And that's probably enough highlighting for his hand on the dark side of the model. Just enough to make it visible, but we don't need to go much further than that. Okay, I'm going to change brushes because this brush is annoying me. Let's grab that uh, Da Vinci size one. That's the one that's been making me happiest lately. Clean the brush. I get it going. <coughs> Okay, that's about better. So I'm going to basically rebuild the color I just had because I was running out. So dark elf skin with a big daub of creamy ivory in it. So a small daub of creamy ivory. So that's the color I was just using. And on the edge of this, I'm going to add another daub of creamy ivory to make the next step lighter. I think you can really see the difference between those two in the palette. Don't want the brush overloaded, so I'm going to clean most of that off the brush. I need good control with the tip of the brush, so I'm going to roll the brush tip repeatedly. Get a nice fine point on it. Okay, that's looking pretty good. That's, that's looking like what I want to work with. I'll start on the face again. So we're going a little a touch lighter now? Is that... This is a touch lighter, yeah. Oh, my eyes are really having a hard time today. There we go. Okay, so that shape that's in the middle of his forehead, that like triangle shape, I'm going to put a little bit of this right there. Okay. A little bit over his right eye to bring up his brow. Same thing over the left eye. Just a little daub of it. Now, I want to keep that broken nose look he had going on, so I'm going to put a touch of this at the top of the nose, but then I'm going to leave a shadow where I want to pretend like it's a broken nose and put this on the tip of his nose. Okay? And then, as I said before, we, last time we painted the whole side of his nose with the highlight color. Now we're just going to paint the side of his nostril to bring the shape of his nose back. And maybe the center of his cheek. Just a little round highlight. And along the side of his mouth and that little cupid's bow. Now the cupid bow is tiny, right? If you don't feel like you can hit it with your brush, just leave it. And I'm going to put a smaller highlight on his chin, but it's on the side facing the light. Not doing any of that on the side towards the dark. So the dark side is going to stay dark. The light side is going to get lighter. And we're going to do this a couple more times so that face is really going to start to come out. Uh, just the tip of his ear on the left. Okay. And with his right ear, we're going to pretty much that whole like triangle shape, including the point of the ear, is going to get this color. Because it's basically directly facing, facing towards the light. There we go. And we do this on his hand. Now, as I said when I started, the, the back of his hand is probably light enough. So I'm going to start with his left hand. The side of the hand facing towards the light. Okay, so that thumb is going to get a fairly large light colored highlight on it. The tips of the fingers facing towards the light side are going to catch the light almost directly so they get a highlight. And my brush stroke direction is towards the light source. I want to be careful not to cover over all that shadow I added in a few minutes ago. There we go. So now you can see the dark side of the hand and the light side of the hand. Okay. Same thing on the thumb, which is kind of hooked into his belt at the top. Nice big light colored highlight on that one. And then the line on the back of his hand out to the top of his knuckle. And starting on the inside, and working my way out, about half as long a highlight as I did the first time. But definitely making sure I get a nice bright highlight on the top of the knuckle. There we go. Now his skin is starting to show up pretty good. And 
This brush is annoying me too. Maybe it's not the brushes today. Maybe it's me. Or carpenter, eh? Yep. Exactly. No, that's another one. Zero. I kid. I kid. No, oh, no, it's true. It's true. <laughs> but on the other hand, I'm recognizing that it's not working for me. So I could always just keep going the same way and be unhappy. Or I can switch to another brush that might make me happier. So I'm going to switch to this Rosemary Co. one today. See what happens. All right. You're going to grab another daub of that creamy ivory color or whatever you're using for your kind of light off-white color. I'm going to mix that in with the gray again. Make another. So I'm going to go two or three more steps light. So there's going to be this one, then another one with creamy ivory, which is mostly creamy ivory, and then I start adding pure white at the end. So we've got two or three more steps to go before we get to the, to the lightest color we're going to use, just to kind of forecast what's coming. But for now, just add a little bit more creamy ivory in to make the next highlight. And I bet you can guess what we're going to do. We're going to do those same highlights again, just smaller and even less on the dark side of the mini. So I don't need to do the tip of that ear that's on the dark side. The one on the other side, the other ear, I will do this color on the top part of the ear. Remember, his hair is going to be bright steel white, so uh, the ear is barely going to show up with a highlight like this. It's going to have to be quite a bit lighter still, or the ear will be invisible. The center of his forehead there, we're going to give that, put that highlight in again. I really want him to have a grim expression, so I'm making that little knot separate. A little knot on his brow on that side, same thing on the other side. Okay, so he's got kind of a grim expression on the go. The cheek on the opposite side from the light. I'm going to put a little tiny highlight up by the corner of his eye. Just a little tiny. I think I grabbed the wrong color. Yes, I did. Oh well. Okay. Just a little touch of it up there. Then I do the highlight in the center of the cheek on the side of the light facing the light. Side of the nose, a little nostril, tip of the nose. And that bump that we put in the middle of his nose is getting another highlight. So he's gonna look kind of craggy by the time we're done. Cupid's bow again. Are you hitting the lips there as well? Nope. The lips are going to be a different color. Okay. There we go. Nice highlight on his face. And now we're going to work on his thumb on his left hand. Up, upper part of the thumb gets a highlight. Quite a large one. The finger at the top, I think we'll put a little bit of a highlight on that face in the light. The second one's got a bit of a shadow from that thumb. The third one gets a little tiny highlight. The fourth one the same. So the middle finger there, which is tucked in behind, we're going to give that little, leave that one a little bit less bright. And then on the hand facing the light side, very similar. Small highlights. Knuckles. There we go. Now, question becomes those eyes. What are we going to do with those tiny little eyes tucked in under the hairline? I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to just do a simple two-step eye on them which means I'm just going to paint the whites of the eyes and leave um, the dark that's there is going to be the iris. So I'm going to roll my brush to a very fine tip point and I'm using this same skin tone color and I'm going to try to paint just one half of those uh, eye sockets with this color and it's the side of the eye socket away from the light source. Now this is a very difficult eye to paint because it's so tiny and tucked in. So if you don't want to try it, don't just don't worry about it. If you do want to try it, you're gonna reach in there and put just a tiniest little dot 
on the side of the eye all away from the light source very very small almost invisible dot there we go you can just make it out on the screen now oh that looks creepy it looks really creepy and it's going to be the really same creepy. I love it. on the other eyeball the dot goes in the exact same position bear in mind if you're not comfortable reaching into that deep deep crevice these are difficult eyes to paint so if you don't feel like trying it don't do it this is when the if you have like a, a an unconditioned brush with a hook on the end of it it actually kind of it could I find help. It's it helpful. really could help or just do what I did to make a mess nothing wrong with making a mess it happens Now, these paint alongs are supposed to be beginner friendly, so if you don't feel like painting the eyes, just leave it. Okay? Now that I've painted the eye and made a mess, I'm going to go back and fix it. And here's how I fix it I go back down a few steps to my much darker colors. I'm going to go right back to the dusky shadow color. And now I, ha I have part of the eye the right color, but I, l I hit the eye, the, the area surrounding the eye as well. So the way I'm going to fix that is I'm going to paint a line along the side of the nose and on the top of his cheek. Kind of bring the dark color back in. And now, got a little bit of a hint of those eyes looking off to the side very unhappily. Okay. It's a very difficult face to paint, so if you don't feel like doing it, just don't. Now, normally when I teach an eye class about painting eyes, I say always paint the eyes. These ones are tough. So if you don't feel like it, it's okay. For the lips, burgundy wine. I'm going to paint the lips burgundy wine now. They've already got a little bit of uh, uh, that shadow color on them. So really, I want to make the top lip burgundy wine. So I'm going to bring the brush in. If this is the mouth, right, the brush comes in. On an angle like this to touch the top lip and then come straight out again that's how I put the shadow on the top lip like that come back out again so you got to orient the mini to the brush there's my brush coming in on the angle I'm just gonna try to put a dab of paint mostly on the upper lip less on the bottom lip now you're likely to hit the bottom lip as well but with a bit of practice you can just hit the top lip I'm going to clean my brush off and I'm going to grab a bit, I think, I think I'm going to grab creamy ivory. I'm going to make a mix of creamy ivory and burgundy wine. And this is going to be the highlight color for the lower lip. So I'm going to do exactly the same thing again. There's the lips, but I'm going to bring the brush in from the other side now and just bring it in on an angle to put a dab on the lower lip like that. So there's the mini, there's the brush coming in from the other direction just to put a little highlight on the lower lip. And there it is. And that's enough for him to look like he's got a face. Okay. Now if you wanted to you could do a glaze on the skin but I don't feel like doing that today, so I'm not going to. All right. We're going to call that face done. Next thing I'm going to do is the hair. So there's my black indigo. This was the mix I made with the snow shadow earlier. I'm going to make some of that fresh. There we go. Sorry, Jeff. What was the main color on the uh, lips? I, I got stuck trying oh, to fix uh, my eyes. Sorry. <laughs> Burgundy wine with just a little touch of... So the, the shadow color on the lips was burgundy wine. Right. And the highlight, I mixed a bit of creamy ivory just to make a slightly lighter version of the burgundy wine. Okay. And that was it. And now I'm making the color for the hair. So I mixed a bit of snow shadow in with the black indigo. And this is going to be 
my first color on the hair. Now we already put a base coat on the hair earlier. And what I'm going to do this time is my light direction is here, so it's kind of a, a sphere-shaped head. So I'm going to put a highlight right around there in the direction facing the light source. And it's going to be like a round highlight right on the side of his head. And I'm kind of ignoring the texture of the hair for now. When I get to the end, I'll paint the texture of the hair a bit more carefully. But for now, I just want a round dot of this color. And then I'm going to look for anywhere that I've got an outward curve, a convex curve facing the light. So this little bit of hair on his temple has a curve facing the light, so I'm going to highlight that with a little bit of this color. As I come down his face, I can see that there's a bit of a curve in the hair there that faces the light. So I'm going to put a highlight on the outermost part of that curve. If I look underneath this part of his hair, under like the left side of, left side of his face, his left or right, there's a round shape there. I'm just going to put a line of this color along it so that it's visible. work my way around. So there's the highlight that I already did. I'm going to do that one again. I think it needs to be stronger. There we go. The hair where it comes over his head, that's all good. Make my way around to the back. Now in the back, this part of the curve, the light's over here. So that light is going to kind of glance off of that and hit her eye. But it's not going to be a really bright highlight, but it is still going to be a round looking highlight. So I'm going to put a bit of that shape there. And when we finish this highlight, it's going to look a bit like the, the halo effect on his head. Okay, so a bit of a halo along the back. Back around to that highlight we just did. There we go. Be careful not to paint over his ear. His ear. Alright. I look down on his back at this part of the hair. There's an outward curve there. So I'm going to put it highlight on the outside of that shape and down here it curves outward as well so I can put a highlight on that again anywhere that it curves outwards I'm going to put a highlight generally facing towards the light now technically the highlight should be slightly closer to the observer than towards the light source uh, but we're not going to be too fixated on that today Outside of the curve. Work the way around this bit of the hair outside of the curve as well. Keep working our way around. And then finally, the side of the head away from the light. I don't know if you can see that, but I've got a big daub of light colored paint in there. And I'm going to fix that now with this color, put it right over it. Okay, there we go. Now, this is going to be a steel white hair color, so we're going to go quite a bit lighter. So I'm going to grab a big daub of snow shadow, mix that in with my previous color. And I redo all those highlights a little bit smaller. So we'll start in the same place again on the crown. I'm going to make this round highlight on there. Again, ignoring the hair texture. A little round highlight there. Okay, and now we're going to go looking for those outwards curves. So there's the curve right there on his, uh, on the top of his head. Right there, up to that little bit of hair there. There's the outward curve underneath. Okay, 
there's that outward curve on this this shape of his hair. So we're gonna put one there. And remember, these, this is going to be white hair, so these highlights can be quite large. Just don't completely cover over the shadow colors, because without the shadow color, the white is not going to look light. We need to keep the shadow color there as a contrast to make the white look like white. So we've got this outward curve shape. Oh, sorry, right there, this one. So this is the hair that's over the back of his shoulders. Nice big highlight. And more on the upper half of that shape than on the lower half, but still close towards the, uh, towards kind of the, if you picture it as a little hill, there's a crest across it. So we want most of the highlight to be centered on that crest and a little bit of it above. More above than below, but really centered on that crest. That's just going to make it look like shiny white hair. Okay, we'll do the same thing on the next roll. And we'll keep going all the way around. And this is going to be the lightest highlight on the dark side of his body. Okay, the lightest highlight on the dark side because it's pure white when we're done um, it's still going to be quite visible on the shadow side it's just not going to be white but we want it to be quite light not as light as on the light side but not so dark that it doesn't look like white anymore working all the way all the way around and in there between the staff and his body that needs a little highlight in there too okay and then we're going to go back and do the halo starting from above his ear. Okay. And working our way all the way around, making that halo shape. All right, it's coming along. Next layer, right on top of that one, is going to be just straight snow shadow. And once again, we're making a highlight that's not as big as the previous layer, but still pretty big. Just bear in mind that when we go to the shadow side, if we do any snow shadow on the shadow side of the, of the guy's body, uh, those highlights will be have to be carefully placed otherwise it's going to start to look too light on that side okay so we'll start on the light side start with our round highlight again up at the top of the crest of his head facing our light direction still ignoring the texture there's our round highlight And now we'll go back looking for those convex shapes again, right across the crest of his hair there. Now, probably people want to ask, why don't you just paint this color right from the start? If we do, we don't get enough depth in the shadow. And without that depth, it doesn't look like hair. It just looks like... Um, looks like plastic but by doing this it's going to really give the hair that kind of characteristic streaky look even if it is shiny hair it's still going to have that sort of characteristic look of hair and if it doesn't have enough depth and variety of color it doesn't look right the curve underneath 
on the side of his face. We get that one as well. And now we're back to the curves across the back of his shoulders again. Still quite a large highlight. Still kind of ignoring that texture. It's okay if you leave some shadow in the middle of all this. But generally speaking, ignoring that texture. All the way around. Really focused on that ridge like I was talking about before. The ridge across here. Ridge across there. Keep going. Working our way around. Now once I get to the shadow side, really just going to put a couple of tiny little licks of this color, not much. And then in the zone in between the staff and the hair, put a little bit in there, but not much. Just on the most raised pieces of the hair texture. There, that's more than enough. And then I'm going to go back and do the halo again. Start over here. Work my way around. You're reapplying the same color on the highlight on the same halo, is that right? Color. Same color still, just straight snow shadow. All right. The next one we're going to do, we're going to start adding um, pure white into this. But it's going to be the same process again, all the way around. It's already starting to look like a good light colored hair, but it really needs still quite a lot more contrast. So next step, snow shadow. 50-50 with pure white, or solid white, I think is what I've got on there, but you want a nice bright white. I'm going to have to clean my brush off, it's getting a bit dried out. Now you want to make sure you, when you're cleaning your brush, you don't leave too much water in there, because the water is what pushes paint out. So if you have water in your brush and you load it up with more paint, put the brush on the mini, that's when you get your flood. Oh, nobody wants a flood right now. Especially not on the hair, right? Because on that hair texture, the flood's going to carry the light paint down into the shadow areas, and that's not what we want at all. Okay, away we go. Same thing again, just a little bit smaller. So, focus on that crown area. Nice light highlight there. Kind of a round shape. Now I'm going looking for those convex curves again along the, the part. Just a line of outward curve underneath by his face. Curve on the front. I'm noticing now there's a zone under his ear that I keep missing in there. And uh, I'm just going to live with it. I'm just going to accept that I probably should have painted it, but I didn't. And maybe when I refine this model at the end, I'll decide whether I want to go back and fill in that space in there. But for now, I'm just going to leave it. So now I'm doing the outward curve of this hair shape over his shoulders. I'm still not painting the individual strands of hair, right? Like I'm just treating that whole roll of, of hair as a single single like little hill shape. A little bit of a defect there I should have filled in. I'll fill that in later if I feel like it, I guess. Kind of focused on that ridge line 
along there. Long. I'm not going to go all the way along the back of the hair because we need the light hit to hit it to be able to have this reflection. And the light's not hitting it, so we're not going to put the reflection. So now we go back to the crown of his head and we start doing the the halo again. A little bit smaller, but still ignore the hair texture. We're putting a halo all the way around his head with this lighter color. And the next one we're going to do is going to be pure white, but because what's underneath the pure white is blue, it's going to kind of dull down the first pure white highlight that we do. And then we're going to go back again and do a second highlight of pure white, and that one will start to look much, much lighter when you've got the, like that duplicate layers of, of white. my way all the way around and yet I'm going all the way around in spite of the fact that the light is coming from the other side I'm going to do the side of his head which is in the dark as well if it feel like it's too light then later I can dull it back down again with the, the glaze but for now I'm going to make it very very light there we go and now, as I said, we go back and do that same highlight again, slightly smaller, straight white paint. And just, again, be cautious about water in your brush, because now is when it's very frustrating to have a flood. If you do have a flood, it's useful to have a second brush right at hand to kind of wick up the excess paint and lift it out again. And if I make a mess, I've got one of my other, where's that, uh, what brush was I using a minute ago? Uh, doesn't matter, one of these. There's a spare brush in case I need to lift out a flood. So, I'm going to start up in the heat where the that round highlight was up at the top first. Fill that in. Round highlight. round highlight and now I'm looking for outward curving shapes so that's along the part right there underneath his face outside of this lock of hair here And then we're doing the curve across the back of his shoulders again, still ignoring the hair texture, focusing on the crest of that ridge shape. When we do the next layer, we're going to just hit the raised surfaces of the hair texture, okay? Now we're going to go back and do the halo. Oops, sorry, I drifted. There's my, almost there with the white hair. The last step is going to be one more white highlight, just hitting the raised edges of surfaces. So on the crest up there, I'm just going to do pure white across the raised surfaces of the hair texture. Same thing down here on that little bit, just the raised areas. Across the back of his shoulders now. I'm not now I'm I'm paying attention to the texture. 
I'm only going to highlight the raised texture, not the whole thing. And then same thing with the little halo effect. Okay, now if there's, I've got my my hair that almost looks white, and now the next step would be to do a wash over that or a glaze over that, depending on your preference. Um, I do tend to do a bit of a wash at this stage, and I would do the wash with the indigo. Now I want to give that a moment to dry, so I'm going to just stop painting for a moment, and. Uh, just check one thing here. Okay. So if uh, this is a good chance where the people that are painting along, if you have questions, it's a good time to ask them. Um, I put a mark in the video so we can delete this part out. And then uh, if you want to post a photo, like snap a photo with your phone, drop it in the chat. Um, I can take a look. And if you have any questions, we can give you immediate feedback. And then, uh, then we'll carry on with the painting. If you don't want to take a photo and drop it in the chat, if you don't need a few minutes, please let me know that too. And then we'll, uh, we'll carry yeah, on. Yeah, I'm just going to play and catch up right here, just being okay. finicky with the hair. Hey, I'll, um, I was catching up just to hair too. I think uh, now I'm going to pick in just a second. Okay, cool. I don't. I, I'm. I'm on my computer with the Discord, so I don't know how to. I'll have to. Bring yeah, no go back to your phone. <laughs> yeah. No worries. It's just. Uh, I mean, it's bonus material, right? You don't have to if you don't. Yeah. Uh... I'll. I'll send. I'll send you. What, I'll send you a Facebook pic later. Yeah, I was gonna say while you're, while you're nearby, just jump in your car, drop down, show it to me, and then head home again. That's what I want to get to eventually, is, is have people here in the studio as well, so we can paste things to a, a class of people that are present, and then have people asking questions as we go. Um, I think we'll try to do that starting in January, but we'll see how, it, uh, how we progress. All right. I am going to start building my... I'm going to do a little bit of a wash here. So I'm going to grab a dollop of that black indigo and move it right off to the far corner of my palette. I'm going to start adding water into it. So I want it to be pretty thin. Are you guys with me or am I uh, starting to launch ahead of you now? I'm going to get a picture with my phone. Okay. Yeah, I'm in the process of trying to get a picture, too. Oh, wait. Oh, um, wait. Yeah, oh, I haven't started the glaze mix yet. Hold on. Yeah, no worries. I'll, I, I'm putting the mini down. I'm putting the brush down. I'm taking a pause. There's the dude for, for reference. And uh, Aaron will cut this part out. <laughs> All right. In fact, I'm going to turn my mic off for a second and eat my... Actually, I've got to try and find the, um, yeah, it, it, you want to post it in the chat part here, right, for this um, session? You can just drag and drop it right in the chat. All right. I just sent you a message on Facebook. Rolling again. Let me just take a quick look at uh, Kevin. Did you drop anything? Oh, very good. There we go. Have a quick look. I'll ask you. I think the first feet of light was so bright, I just blew it out. But uh, I tried to turn the light down a little bit because I have like five mega lights on it. Um, but it's still, it, you know, my my higher highlights bled over too much into my shadowy ears. I was I can just going to say exactly the same thing. So th this this zone. Can you see my little? Uh, what's that thing called? Yes, yeah, so I can tell. Yes, yeah, so I can. I can see your so porter. That is pretty good. 
that is hitting the zones correctly, but you you're probably your last two or three highlights were way, way too big. Right? Yes, yeah, so you so lost I can tell. all that separation between the shadow area and the light area. But you, that, that's that's other than that last bit of rope, that was the uh, sort of the right approach. Now you, you heard what I was saying to Sean as well, right? Like you, you gotta kind of force oh, yourself yeah, for to, sure. yeah. to start. And uh, when I do this now, I uh, it kind of is an instinct to do it, but you gotta really force yourself to do it the first few times. And actually, it's a good bit of kind of homework. Um, it's worth going to take a look, kind of get a sense of the way it should look. All right. So now the plan is we're going to do a bit of a glaze, uh, no, a wash over this. And it's going to make it look dirtier again, because what's going to happen is the, the wash is going to fall into the space in between the, the, the different shapes and the texture on the hair. So after I do this, I'm going to go in and try to pull a bit of this off of, uh, out of the highlights. And that'll make more sense as I do it. So I'm going to start at the top of the head back here. And this is a side I want to be darker anyway. So the paint I'm using is about that thick. I'm sorry, what did you make the glaze with again? Which uh, one? The... This is black indigo. Black indigo. Okay. And the reason I like the black indigo for this is it doesn't turn particularly um, chalky. Where, like, for example, the nightshade purple might turn a bit chalky. But uh, we just fix it afterwards. Okay, so I got my glaze on my brush. What I do is I'm going to start at the top of the head. I'm going to pull the glaze down. I'm going to go slowly so it has a chance to kind of go into the low spaces. And I go all the way, pull the way all the way to the bottom, from the top all the way to the bottom. And it's going to darken some of those recesses again. But the overall shape of the highlights is still going to be visible. It'll show through the glaze. So this is, goes back to what you were talking about earlier, Sean, where like you want that texture to be visible. This brings the texture back, but we don't lose the shape of the highlights overall. And then the final step is, once it's dry, we're going to go back in and just do the final white highlights again. And it's going to look like quite a nice bright white hair. And if it doesn't, we just redo the highlights again. And keep going. Okay, so now we need to let that dry. Do that underneath his face here as well. Let that dry, and then we're going to come back and redo the white highlights. Okay. Okay. So, next thing to do, we're going to do the um, little roby thing at the bottom. We'll start bringing that up a bit. So, that was burgundy wine with a little bit of a uh, tiny bit of red in it initially so now we're going to take the let's put snow shadow in it just for fun let's make a mix of burgundy wine and snow shadow okay and this is going to be the highlight color for the robe at the bottom and we're just going to put some dabs of color on that to make the shape more visible and to give you an idea of how we're going to this is how we're going to do the armor as well so as i start let's start on the light side there's my light arrow so the shapes that are facing towards the light, I'm going to put some dabs of this color, just randomly make dots of this color, just in the area facing directly towards the light. And it's going to darken as it dries, but what it's going to do is it's going to start to make the shape a little bit more visible. We're going to catch the edge of the details, like these little tears in the cloth. And after doing a few layers of this, those shapes are going to start to be more visible. Okay, so there's the first round of it. You can already see the shape starting to be more visible. I'm going to grab some more snow shadow, put another dollop of it in there, make it lighter. And I don't have to wait for this to dry. Okay, I can just keep doing these dabs of paint on the light side. And you want them to be small and random. You don't want to make like a dot pattern. But what we don't want to do is kind of do, here I'll do it wrong first, go 
dot 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 that's not what we're looking for because that regular pattern your eye will find it we want to make it random and irregular so I kind of go zigzag all over the place without making like a, a perfect circle apply a different amount of pressure each time some are bigger dots some are smaller dots and it's going to make that cloth look quite battered but it's still going to make it look like it's uh, catching the light from the direction of our light source. You're just going to dab and dab and dab and dab and dab. I want to make sure I dab more on the edges of any shape. So like where there's little cuts in the cloth. I'm going to give them a few little extra dabs. Extra dabs. That's the technical official term is extra dabs. And I know that this part of the cloth is really not important at all in the overall structure. But this gives you a chance to practice the idea before we go and try and do it on the black armor. And we want to do much less of that over on the shadow side. Just a few little dabs. Now I'm going to grab some creamy ivory, mix that in, make it lighter again. So why did I change from the cold paint with the blue to the warm paint with the ivory, paint with the ivory? Just uh, so that without making the values too high, without making a really light paint, that little bit of warmth is going to make the, the dots stand out against the cold background a little bit easier. So it's a little bit of a, it's a way to get the highlights to look better, a little bit more contrast without having to really make the paint very light colored. So I'm going to start looking for the edges of shapes like the cuts and the tears. I'm going to start putting these much lighter colored dots along the edges of them. Just enough to make the shapes a little bit more visible. Along the edge of the cloth. A little hem there. And then as I get working my way to back towards the light source, I'm going to start putting more and more tiny little dots. To make the shape of that little curve stand out. Stand up a bit. It also helps to rotate your brush so you don't end up making all the dots like parallel dashed lines. A little bit more random looking. Okay, so there we go. That's how we're going to do this armor. So now if we go and do a glaze of burgundy wine over all of this, it's going to dull down a lot of these dots, but the, the little dot texts are still going to be visible through it. We could even go a little bit lighter. Let's go one, one step lighter. And just focus on this side. Just focus on the side towards the light. There we go. And we're going to let that dry. And now our glaze up on the hair is dry so that. Uh, the shape should be quite visible, the highlight should be quite visible, but they're not quite pure white anymore. So we make sure we get our brush really clean. Before we load it with pure white. Would you mind uh, just showing me that skirt one more time before you get in there? Just see where you're at there. Okay. Yep. Okay. So awesome. I'm, letting, Thank you. I'm letting that dry, and now while I'm waiting for that to dry, we're going to do the reapply the white highlights on the on the hair. So I'm just going to do the ones that are like, just going to do the top of the textures. Uh, 
and that's going to bring that shine back. So for, for the ones that you guys, where the, the highlights were really long, when you go now and do these highlights again, just don't make them nearly as long as you did with your last highlights. And the, the glaze should have dulled it down quite a lot. And putting these white dots back on should make it look shiny again. But it won't look shiny <coughs> if you make the dots too big. I'm going to keep them nice and small, and then it's going to look like shiny hair again. My glaze went on a little too heavy. You did the glaze a little too heavy? Yeah. So all you do then is you just go back a couple of steps further, maybe go all the way back to your, um, to the snow shadow layer. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm at. Yep, and then bring it back up again. And that's, that's pretty normal, right? Like when I'm doing, trying to make the hair look really good, I might do this process a few times until I get the balance exactly right. Well, it's helpful that's because I, it helps, it allows me to fix that mistake that I made. Okay. There we go. All right. Yeah, so my glaze ended up looking a little bit too blue, so I've got to go back and fix it at some point too. Yeah. And that happens. So... It just means that probably the glaze was uh, not thin enough, right? Yeah. And the other thing is when you apply the glaze, um, like I was saying, you, 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 you put it on, but you, you're pulling most, most of it off. So I put on that glaze, right? But when I run the brush down, I actually pull most of it off. So just a touch of it ends up on the purple, and most of it ends up being moved down into the crevices by pushing it off to the side like that. So it darkens the shadows without having a huge impact on the top. And it takes a bit of practice to get that to work. Because quite often what we do when we start out is we end up doing that. And that dulls everything down. Mm. But I really want it just pushed off to the, pushed into the low spot where the shadows are. And then of course you get the coffee stain effect. Which you can see it happen on my thumbnail right there. And when that happens, that's why we go back and we do those final highlights again. It just covers up that last bit of the coffee stain. All right. So let's do the cloak now. So we did a couple of highlight layers on the cloak. So now we're going to start bringing the red right up bright. So the first couple layers we did were um, burgundy wine mixed with fire red. Now it's time to just do a layer of straight fire red right on top of what we've already got going on. Now these highlights, we don't want them to be too big. And the brush direction matters. The, the direction of the brush stroke should be towards the light so, source. So that when we have a highlight somewhere like on the top of the shoulder, pointed towards our light source, we come at it from two directions. The first brush stroke comes at from the shadow towards the highlight from one side. Okay, so the brush strokes are all right to left, and then we come from the other side, and all the brush strokes are going to be right to left to pull the pigment up towards the point of the shoulder, the spot closest towards the light source. And what that does for us is it gives us overlapping layers of pigment closest towards the light source and it makes the highlights look stronger makes them look really really bright and that's what we're going to do on the cloak so we're going to do that on the other half of the shoulder piece I did the lower part let's do the upper part of the shoulder so from the back to the front and this is just fiery red Jeff this is straight fiery red yeah right on and then the other little lip of that from the front towards the back 
We get a nice bright highlight on top there. And then we're going to do that on his collar. He's got that little scarf going on. And you want to do this carefully now because your hair is pretty much done. And the face is done. So we just want to hit the most raised areas of that scarf. We definitely don't want pooling either. So if the paint starts to make like little blobs of pooled paint, you've got too much paint on the brush, you want to get that paint off of there. There we go. This shoulder over here, just a little bit from right to left, and then a bit from right, sorry, a little bit from left to right first, and then meet it by going to the right and pulling it back. And the highlight should end up on that edge of that plate closest to the light source. Down here on the cloak. We're just going to hit the raised areas where the cloak is torn, where there's an edge visible on the cloak, outside from under his arm. We're not going to do the area under his arm this color. There's be a shadow there. Okay. Don't worry about the back of it when we get all the way around. Now I'm going to do this edge of the cloak along here. I'm just going to run the brush along that edge where it would catch the light. I'm not going to go right in underneath because the light is almost directly parallel to that edge. We're just going to pretend that not much light gets under there. A little bit up here. So that's for the underneath part of the cloak. Now we're going to do the part of the cloak that the light's going to hit directly. So we line it up to our light source. There's our arrow. We look at the cloak so we can see that the outside edge of that highlight is going to get red. This highlight out, or this ridge out here is going to get red. And a bit of the next one back is going to get red. So let's start right here. I'm going to start at the bottom, because the light is closer to the top, so I'm going to start at the bottom, my brush strokes are going to go upwards. I'm going to run the brush sideways along the outside of the cloak there. By running my brush upwards, I'm going to get more pigment pulled upwards, and it'll end up closer towards the light. There we go. I'm going to do the same thing on this next one below that. Focusing really towards the front of the cloak. And now I need to turn the mini over again and do the same brush stroke so that the tip of my brush is touching the one that I just did and the belly of my brush is kind of rubbing against that shadow. And that's going to give me a bit of a smoother transition between the shadow and the red. My brush stroke still going only in the upward direction. I'm not going back and forth, just going up, lift, back, and then going up again. The brush stroke's always pulling upwards. Give me a nice bright highlight on that round piece of cloth. Come back at it from the other side. I'm going to do that one again because the red's a little bit transparent. And then this one, one step back, same idea. Just towards the front side of it. So I'm going to go up this way. brush over, the mini over, in the same direction on the, uh, on the other side of this ridge of cloth, go this way.
Okay, and now if I look at it from my light direction again, pretty much everything the light's going to hit directly is highlighted red. If I look at it from the opposite direction, there's my arrow. Look at it from this direction. Things are not... There you go, like that. Things are not highlighted bright red. That side's dark. That side's light. And our light direction is really strongly indicated. Okay. So, is that light enough on the cloak, do we think? Or should we go one layer lighter? We should go one layer lighter. That's the right answer. So how do we do that? There's a couple different ways. We could add a light colored flesh tone into the, uh, into the red. We could add an orange into the red. We could add white to make it pinker. I think I'm going to use a little bit of flesh tone. So I grabbed rosy highlight, uh, just a kind of a standard, very fair colored uh, skin tone. I'm going to build my highlights with that. Give myself a bit more fire red. I think that fire red is empty. I'm going to grab a new one. Okay, let me figure it out again. Um. Okay. Oh, let's double check. Okay. All right, brand new bottle of fire red. There we go. Check the other one in the leftovers bin. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a little bit of that skin tone. It's gonna be a little bit pinky, but it's gonna give me a lighter paint to work with. On this, I'm gonna go back and do those highlights again, just a little bit smaller. Are we glazing this cloak? No, no. This is this paint is uh, unthinned as yet. No, I mean, like, are we going to glaze eventually? Yes. Okay. So there's the area I want to work in. I'm just going to hit the highest highlights of these shapes. Not too much paint loaded on the brush, just a touch. And being cognizant of the brush stroke direction so that I create the highlights closer to the light direction only. Okay. Uh, on the cuts on the cloth down there, just going to catch those corners with this. Make those tears really visible. Up here on the shoulder, remember we want the highlight to be straight towards the light, so pull up towards the top. From right to left. And we reverse it and pull from left to right. You can do that on this edge of the cloak as well. And then we're going to hit this edge along here of this raised roll of cloth. So I'm going to start here and work my way up. Start almost at the bottom, not quite at the bottom, but almost. I hit the hair. Well, if before it dries, grab another brush, get some water on it, and basically like try to erase it like you're using an eraser, and that should help get some of it off. Each of these little folds is going to get a similar tiny little highlight. And this big fold of cloth gets a nice big one. Brush strokes going from the bottom towards the top always. Turn the mini around to make it easier. OK, 
Okay, we got a nice bright highlight going on there. And let's go one layer brighter. We're going to make the big doll put that rosy skin tone in there, or whatever skin tone you're using. And we'll do these highlights one more time in exactly the same places. Just, I mean, you got the pattern now, right? It's uh, smaller highlights in the same places. Overlap that one again by coming from the right to the left. Do this edge where the little rents and tears are. And now I'm looking for this shape right here. Along that. Brush strokes always going from the top to the bottom. No, oh, bottom to the top, sorry. Towards the light. Okay, now we got a pretty good base there to do some uh, glazing over, but I'm going to go brighter again. Can't stop myself. Got to go brighter. So I'm just going to use straight skin tone and do a highlight over those spots. So I'm not going to do it everywhere, but just closest to areas closest to his face. So like the, the scarf up front is getting a little bit of this just where the light would catch it the brightest. The edge of that armor plate. Let's do the center of the armor plate. Edge of the shoulder pad. And I think we need to do these little tears. And those brightest highlights. Just enough to kind of pick the shapes out. There we go. I'm happy with that. Okay. Nice and bright towards the light source. All right. We need to let that dry before we do the glaze over it. How are you guys making out? I'm just catching up a bit on the highlights. Okay. Doing all right. So, next step is going to be, what do you have time left to do? Okay, let's do the armor. Let's do the, the bulk of the armor now. So, what I've got on my palette, I've got the black, I've got that wolf gray, I've got the, a bit of a bone color, I've got a bunch of different colors here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that black, I'm going to refresh my dark gray that I made, I'm going to add a bit more wolf gray into that, make a lighter mix. And this, what we were doing earlier with stippling the uh, the purple coat, that's what we're going to do now on the armor. And we're really focused on the side of the armor towards the light. 
and not filling in the shadows between plates. So we're going to start somewhere pretty easy to do this, which is the center plate right in the center, right in here. He's got a belt, some belt pouches, and this little triangle shaped plate. The triangle shaped plate, the light is on the left, so it's going to be lighter on the left side of the plate. So we're going to dab light dots all over it, mostly concentrated in that direction. At the bottom, where that plate kind of protrudes a bit, is there's going to be a shadow underneath it. So I'm not going to put dots immediately over that line. I'm going to leave a gap and put the dots further away from it below. So it looks like it's casting a shadow on the next plate. Okay, and by keeping them separate like that, it's going to define the different plates of the armor, but at the same time, giving our armor a bit of shape like it's catching the light. So I'm just going to keep doing that and work all the way down this triangle plate. Making sure I don't fill in all the way to the edge of those plates and hide the shadows. Okay, I'm going to keep doing that on all the armor plates that I can see. So like the belt right there is going to get this. Okay, that was my, somebody calling me to tell me that today is Sword Art Online Day. Apparently, if you watch the Sword Art Online anime, today is the day that that game starts <laughs> in, the, in the anime. Anyway, vitally important, and I appreciate her calling to tell me that. All right, so I'm going to keep doing the dots in the gray. You guys are probably ahead of me in this process now. You can probably guess which way it was going to go. And we're just focused on hitting those, those highlight zones. Bringing up the shape a little bit. Is it pretty much right now the um, solid gray, or does it still have black in it? Uh, this is, uh, I would say, half black, half gray at this point. So it's a little bit lighter than the first layer, but not very much lighter. Just a little bit lighter. It also means that when I go back and do black lines at the end, they're going to look really dark against this gray color. And in the raised areas, it's random dots. Now to make the leather look really interesting, we don't have to just do dots with gray and black. We can mix a lot of other colors in there as well and make it look a bit more visually interesting. As I work my way around the arm, I'm just going to focus on the top part of the arm. Uh, the, the arm has like a little double baffle by his um, by the cuff. So I'm going to try to paint the cuff separately from the rest of the armor. On the arm. There we go. And then this chest plate, I'm going to give it lots of dots very carefully so I don't put it all over the red. And our light source is 
in this direction. So I'm going to again put more of the dots facing towards the light. And make them a little bit more spaced out the further away I get from the light. Some pretty beat up looking armor already. Okay, so now, like I said, you don't have to just use the gray. So, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to grab some burgundy wine. And on the, in the, the zone between the light and the shadow, so that's like, like, let's say this armor plate here on his chest. The brightest light area is going to be this side, the shadows on this side. So on the shadow side, I'm going to overlap the dots that I just did with a bunch of burgundy wine dots closer towards the shadow. Not a lot, just a few. And when they dry, they're going to darken that area a little bit and give it an interesting looking texture, like maybe it's snake skin or it's skin of some unknown subterranean creature but when these darker dots dry I'm going to go back to using the gray and my next lighter layer of gray I'm going to overlap it right over the edge of all these purple dots and that's going to make the leather look really interesting I'm going to get some really interesting visual effect without a lot of work So if you ever have the chance to watch um, a YouTube channel called uh, Crow's Nest, it's a Twitch channel called The Crow's Nest, uh, the guy who runs that, Michael Proctor, is really good at doing this kind of dot technique, these stippled textures and highlights and things. And he does uh, just painting like this on the Reaper Twitch stream every week. It's called The Crow's Nest. It's a really good channel. Okay, there we go. We've got a whole bunch of purple dots to make our armor look a little bit more confusing. A bit more battered. A bit more interesting. And now I'm going to go back to my pile of gray. And I do some more light dots. But this time, instead of adding gray into it, I'm going to add some skin tone. I said you don't have to just use the same grays all the time. We'll add a bit of skin tone in it this time to lighten it up. I'm going to concentrate the next round of dots more on the light side, but you can let some of them go over top of the purple. So like right here in the middle, you can see the purple dots. I'm going to do lots of little dots closer towards the light. I let them overlap back towards the purple. That's going to give my shape an interesting look here. I might have gone a little too light on that. It's one of the fun things about this kind of technique is if it went a little bit too light, well, I can go back over it with a row of darker dots and push that light color back into the background again without covering up everything I've already done. It doesn't get rid of all the, the lights that are, the highlights that are at the back. I mean, the highlights that are underneath them don't disappear. That's what I'm trying to say. And the irregularity of the texture doesn't disappear. just a tiny little bit of pressure it doesn't take much pressure and you don't want to create like a a uniform layer of dots you want to make sure that they're not really a hundred percent connected with each other 
so that the color underneath can still show through. And it gives it a very battered, sort of weathered look. come along all right and I'm gonna go another layer lighter I'm gonna grab some of that bone color I think add a dab of bone color into our mix and now I'm gonna go back and do that again but I'm looking for the edges of shapes now to put little lines of dots along the edges of things like they've been cut or scratched so like this plate here in the middle I'll put some dots down along the edge of it Towards the point. There we go. This one has stitching on it, so I'm going to try to catch the top of the raised bits of stitching. And then along the edge of that plate as well. I find painting dots like this really relaxing, kind of fun. I agree, it's very satisfying. go our dark elf with this very battered armor okay I feel like I need some of these little dots down below as well I don't know why but I'm gonna do it just on the edge of the torn torn bits of cloth and I think the reason I want to do that is so that they're kind of lit the same so that the tears and everything are all appear to be in the same light source Uh, that's what I wanted. Much better. Okay, so we're going to leave that now, let it dry. And while that's drying, we got a couple more things to do. We're going to do the glaze of red now over the cloak. We're then going to do the bone. And if we have time, we probably won't have time, but we'll try. We'll do the spider at the end. So with that in mind, let's actually do the spider. Let's put a base coat of black on the spider. So what I want you to try to do is don't paint the whole like skull and everything black, just paint the spider black. So don't overload your brush. Go looking for these individual legs of the spider. And give them a coat of black paint. the legs individually and you want to look for that kind of bulbous body shape which is right about there kind of extends down onto the top of the staff you might have to fake it a little bit if it's not there there's the, his head and he's got little teethy things at the front I know they've got a name but I don't remember them offhand and there's his legs at the back So the spider is clinging to the skull. Okay, so that should be dry by the time we're done glazing the red on the cloak. 
and we can go back and play with that for a few minutes before the end. All right, so now what we're going to do, we're going to go back to the reds. And the red we're looking for is the fire red. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the fire red and we're going to make a glaze out of it. To make the glaze, we take a daub of the fire red off to the side. And we put a whole bunch of water in it. The purpose of this glaze is to blend together the highlights that we made that are lighter than the red, which is these ones up here. So the idea here is that we're going to put the glaze and pull it from the top down so that it leaves a dot of red like that. And then we're going to pull it from the bottom up. So it's going to make two sets of red dots, one from the top and one from the bottom. Okay, but we want them to overlap each other in the middle. And we want this line of red dots to end up being where, it's already, where the mini is already that color, which is in this zone between the shadow and the light. Okay, so watch what I do here. I'm going to start on the shoulder. It's the easiest place to do it. So I'm going to start on this side. I'm going to pull all the way across to the other side. So I start down here, and this, this color already exists right there. I go pull the paint all the way atop, across the top of the shoulder, not letting it pool anywhere, and I pull it down off the top of the shoulder to around there. And then I start down at the bottom, and I pull the glaze up so that it all lands more or less in the same spot in that area, which is already this color. So what does that achieve for me? It brings back my color saturation, but it doesn't hide the highlight that we made. And it's going to give the appearance of a bright red cloak illuminated from that direction. So I'm going to do the same thing in every area of the cloak that has those highlights on it. So like in the corner by that shoulder, do the same thing, pull it across that, but then push it into the corner. This bit of the scarf here, Pull it across so that the light red ends up back in the shadow. And the reason we do it that way is that when it dries, it doesn't make these coffee stains on top of the highlights. The coffee stains end up inside the red, and they don't show up because the red is already this color. Okay, so this is the essence of a blending glaze, is to control where the glaze lands. So when I do it on the front of the cloak here, okay, this is the highlight that I want to preserve. And the area below it, so I want it to be red, so I'm going to start at the top and pull down. And as I pull down, I'm going to push that red dollop into the shadow, about halfway between the shadow and the highlight, and let it dry there. I'll do that up here as well. Pull the pull red down across there, and you can see the red dot. Keep pulling that red dot down until it lands on a spot which is already the same color right in there like that. Same thing up here. Pull it down and then come from the bottom and pull that dollop back up. As it dries and it darkens it's going to hide a little bit of the roughness of our blending with our layering that we did. But the highlights are still going to be visible, still going to look like a highlighted cloak, but it's going to look redder. We want to do this on the lit side. We'll keep those red dots on the lit side of the mini. In the area just below the brightest highlights. Okay. That area just outside of that highlight is where the color saturation is going to be highest. Not quite in the shadow. And once you get back into the shadows, the color saturation is going to go down again. But that zone in between the highlight and the shadow is where the color is richest. There we go. And now, as it dries, the highlights are going to still be visible, but the cloak is going to look much, much brighter red. Okay. And we can do the same thing over the armor. You have the choice. You could do that with the black over the armor, or you could do it with gray over the armor, whichever one you prefer. I'm going to do it with the burgundy wine over the skirt first, I think. There's my skirt. That zone is burgundy wine, so I'm going to pull down across that, 
and pull those dollops into the shadow in there. Same thing on this piece. Up there and pull it down. Push it into the shadow to dry. So I want to pull it right across, all the way across, and then push it into the shadow under the cloak. And now we do the same thing with our armor. So for the armor, I think I'm going to do it with, I'm going to do it with the um, indigo for no other reason than I feel like it. Just, I want a dark color and I'm going to make it glaze out of it. There we go. Nice thin glaze. All right, so let's start with this chunk of armor here. Pull the brush across that. And I'm gonna push that off of that area into the shadow in behind the staff. Push it right back in there. There we go. With this chest armor plate, same idea. I'm gonna start on the left side, pull it across, and pull it down into the shadow under his arm. Same thing with this arm. I'll start up high, pull it down, put it under his arm. This one's a little bit more challenging. I'm going to start at the top, pull it across, and then deposit it underneath the arm. Same thing with this part of the arm. Pull it across, push it underneath. And then we've got these last bits to do in here. So for this one, I'm going to start on the left and push it across to the right. I'm going to push it in to that belt pouch. Push it in under that belt pouch that I haven't painted yet. This piece here, I'm going to start at the top. I'm going to pull my way down. I'm going to park it at the bottom. Just going to push it right off the bottom of that shape. Put it into the shadow. There you go. Same thing with this piece. I'm going to start on the right. I'm going to push it in behind the red cloak. So pull it down across. One of the keys with this is don't let the, the glaze sit for too long. If you apply it and you let it sit, as it dries, it's going to make those coffee stains. Okay. And it'll be harder to. Uh, well, it actually won't look too bad on the leather, make the leather look, look a bit more beat up, but uh, easier to avoid it if you can. All right, so now there's our armor done, our cloak done, our skin done. 95% of that mini is done except for the details. So we want to let that, dot, that dry before doing the details. Like You can figure out how you want to paint the little scroll there on your own. A little ring deserves a little bit of uh, attention. There's little skull and things on there, little belt pouches. Um, the last thing I want to look at, so the, 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 the bones on the staff, I'm going to grab a bit of the uh, polished bone color that I was using earlier. Maybe a little bit of that on my brush. I'm going to just dab it onto the skull. Not on the spider, just on the skull on the light side, so the side facing towards our light source. Just anywhere the light would hit, so not in the eye sockets. Around the eye sockets, I'm going to try not to hit the spider's legs or his head. I'll do a little bit on the top. Okay, down along the side. And the side of the staff facing towards the light source, I'm going to give that a bit of a highlight of this color too. Now there's like some metal rings. I'm not going to highlight those with this. I'll go above and below them. Down closer to the hand. I'm not going to put this color on the hand, of course. There goes little daubs of color. And I'm going to keep working my way down the staff to about this point here. I'm going to stop there because that's where the staff is going to have a shadow cast on it by the by the robe. 
I'm just going to put a bit of a highlight on the staff along there. Where I said at the start, we're going to treat the staff as though it's all bone. Give it a bit of a highlight on that side. And I think I'm going to go one layer, like highlight lighter. So I'm going to grab the polished bone. I'm going to put a little bit of white in it, like a slightly lighter color. And I'm going to paint that. I'm going to daub it on in all the same places, make another layer of highlights. But smaller than the previous ones, really making sure I keep them pointed towards the light. Pick out the shapes of the skull and the staff. Okay, and we still got that black spider on the top of his staff. All right, so that's the last thing we're gonna do is pick out that spider. So how do we do that now? What I'm gonna do is grab this lighter color that we made with the mixture of skin tone and red. And I'm gonna dab that over top of the black. It's gonna cover the black reasonably well because it's got a lot of white filler in it and the skin tone is a lot of white filler. So when I dab that over the top, just making the highlight. I don't want to completely cover the black, just most of the black, okay? And I'm dabbing it on there to pick out the shape of the spider. Really want to pick out his legs, but leave a shadow around them, right? Just put little dots of paint on there. And what's going to happen is I'm also going to put some straight skin tone highlights on like all the bone, not the bone, the, uh, the junctions of the bits of the spider's body. Make them really, really bright. And then I'm going to paint a layer of red over top of that. And because these things are so light colored, they're going to show right through these, like these little highlights are going to show right through that. And the different elements of the spider's body will be visible, but it's going to look like a red spider. Okay, so, sorry, pick out a bit of the, his legs. Oh, you mean you're going to paint like a the, that red glaze that we used? Not the glaze, just going to use straight red paint. Oh, okay. But because the paint pigments are so transparent, these highlights are going to show right through a single layer of red paint. Now, I wouldn't do this on a larger area like the cloak because it's going to look very patchy, but we want it to look patchy for the body of the spider so we can see all of his little different body parts, right? And when I say a straight layer of red paint, I don't mean like globbing it on. It's going to be a controlled, fairly thin layer of red paint. And again, because the pigments are so clear, these are all going to show through that. That's good enough. Now, I'm going to go back to my fiery red color. My idea with this is going to look like a bit like a, a black widow spider or something black with red highlights. So not a lot of paint on the brush. All right normal amount of paint but I'm going to put it on fairly controlled so there's my legs I'm just going to paint this single layer of red right over the top of that there I just did turning it red and you can see already the highlights show right through that now this works with red it works with uh, yellow and a couple other colors like that 
where the pigments are pretty much transparent. Um, it won't work as well with colors that are more opaque, like ochre or you know dark blues, dark greens that uh, have a lot of black filler in them or whatever they're using to make them darker. Um, it needs to be a pretty much a transparent paint. Now, there are trans like acrylic paints that are made to be transparent. Um, and this really works very well with those. Or Reaper's uh, Clears, Reaper Clear paints. This works really well with those paints too. Because they don't have filler in them, they just have the pigment. The filler's not a bad thing. The filler um, helps you control how opaque the paints are. So like skin tones would not work without filler. There we go, so now we got a red spider. It shows it pretty well in our staff. We got some pretty beat up looking armor. And that's pretty much what we have time for today. Uh, the next thing to do would be to go through and uh, finalize some of the details. You could put a pattern on the cloak if you wanted to. Um, that's actually a really good one for painting patterns on. Uh, paint the little metal bands on the staff, some sort of metallic color. Paint this scroll tube a lighter color or a darker color, depending on what your preference is, either way. And then your mini is done. And at this stage, uh, pretty much everything is just details or a little bit of refinement. Fix your mistakes a little bit if you want to. Tidy things up. I think the last step that I would do on this would be black lining, which means taking my finest pointed brush and then filling in all the black lines. So like, um, for example, like this skull here, right? I would take my black paint, make a slightly thinner mix of it or use a black ink and paint a line around the shape to make its shadow more visible. So let's do dots in its eyes. Paint a line around the base of it. Line around the top of it. And that black line is going to make that shape more visible. Okay, and we do that with every shape. Any Anywhere that two surfaces meet on the mini, we're going to paint that black line. So like these bits of stitching, get a line around them and they become visible again. Same with this one, put a line around it. This one. This little seam. Bring a black line around the bottom of it. And that really brings back the definition of all those shapes and makes them visible again, even if there's not a huge amount of contrast between the colors. This will make it easier to separate the different pieces and see their shapes. In between the fingers, anywhere that two surfaces meet, doesn't matter what they're made of, any two surfaces where they meet, paint a black line around the shape. That will help uh, bring back the definition. All right. I'm going to uh, come back to this guy tomorrow, I think, and give him a little bit more definition to finish him up. And I'll post some pictures of him. Uh, as I said, this video will go on YouTube sometime by the end of the week. And I uh, hope people enjoy painting along and doing the painting this dark elf. I really appreciate you guys asking questions today, and uh, hope we'll have more people the next time. All right, last chance for questions, there, Sean. Um, no, I'm I'm good. Am I the am I the only one left? Yeah, yeah Kevin had to drop out, so. Oh, oh, okay. It's all good. Uh, yeah, no, I I I, uh, I think I. Now that I've kind of I fixed that that glaze on the hair, I've kind of I'm kind of getting what you're uh, what you're putting down about the you know playing with the textures and the light and stuff like that. So it looks it looks better. It certainly isn't like like uh, the same result that you've got there, but um, right on. Yeah, no, I I, de I definitely uh, I'm I'm 
I think I think I got the gist of it. I would I, I'd like to try it again. That I, I like I, that mini that you showed the uh, that that other one that you that you that you brought in there. Um, yeah, I, I'd like to. It looks I, I it's I can't I mean I can't tell in person. It looks like the tech the, the hair textures are a little different. Um, they're they like are the, quite a bit shallower in most yeah. places. Like in this zone in here, they're just as deep as they are on this mini. But like say down there, they're not quite as deep. You can there's yeah. a there's a video you can see of this this mini being painted on our our on our website on the painting classes tab. Scroll yeah. right down and the second video down is how to paint hair and it's this exact mini being painted step by step, slow speed and why and there's there's sample photos of what real hair looks like versus why we're trying to achieve the effect and it's a great uh I, it's it's the way I was taught to paint hair and I, I really like the technique. So it's, yeah, no, uh, it's great. Worth checking out. And this, yeah, the, like I, well, really I like the result on that one. Like like the this like the fine the finer texture. It looks it looks a lot a lot more interesting. I mean, this is great. This is a great model to kind of practice that that technique on. But I'd love to I'd love to try it on something. Like, yeah. There's just there's more there's more waves. There's more depth in that in that other one too. So it it, it definitely uh, it it pops a lot more. It, it pops differently. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. 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 Very cool. All right, Sean. Cool. Well, I'll play. I'll I'll, uh, I'll play around with this a little more, and I'll post. I'll send you a picture. Sounds great, man. All and, right. Uh, we'll see you the next time. Yeah. Thanks a lot, man. Thanks. See ya.